Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. We're here to usher you into the weekend. It is Pride Weekend here in the city of Missoula. As you can see, if you haven't seen these on uh, Catlin Street, these are the skeletons that have been up since Halloween, and I decided to just take a quick picture because one of them wearing the little uh, rainbow flag in the middle. I thought that's, that would be perfect for my morning show. So here I am doing my morning show. So we're going to jump right in. There's a lot of things to talk about, especially with our uh, city council meeting, which went into 10 hours discussing all sorts of kinds of things. But a majority of it, six hours generally, was devoted towards the urban encampment resolution, in which the city looked to ban urban camping at certain hours of the day and have buffer zones away from rivers, streams, schools, and more. So the urban camping went into consent agenda uh, with controversy on what to do about homeless encampment issue in Missoula, which started out as an open conversation working group, quickly turned into banning, creating buffer zones in areas near rivers, schools, and private slash public properties. This created a split amongst the people of the working group and those in the city. The arguments for this simply is the right to exist in place that is unable to keep up with the demands for shelters. According to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, people can set up camp on public lands in the community. However, this last year, Missoula has made a series of people in Missoula uncomfortable with seeing tents pop up in and around the city parks and trails with many close to the river. The city meeting was long and I'll cover some of the highlights from this meeting. And for uh, nearly 10 hours, the city met with citizens, homeless service providers, and downtown business owners about this. And after four hours of, of other presentations in terms of annexations, the egg land presentation for Corner Farm, which pu uh, public comments were heavy in favor of protecting egg land moving forward. So Mayor Andrea Davis kicks us off with a subject banner, and this is what she had to say. We convened, I convened the Urban Camping Working Group in February. Um, this was after the city council who had been uh, working to update our current camping ordinance, um, agreed to put that on hold until after I take office, until we have some greater conversation um, across city council and then a uh, chance to um, uh, hear more from interested uh, parties um, from uh, different sectors of our community. Uh, the working group shared various perspectives from these different interests and um, uh, in terms of the challenges um, for people and by people that are living unsheltered. It was intended to develop actionable recommendations for council to consider. All right, and so uh, they took into consideration some of the actions from the working group. Andrea spoke a long-term plans for shelters and the master plan for the Johnson Street shelter, which will be begin deconstruction of the facility with the next three years to complete phase two of the railroad park. Uh, Nicole Gomez, Justice Initiative Director for Missoula Women Votes, was on, on board and she spoke on this as well. This resolution, as currently written, doesn't reflect the priorities that we and a number of working group participants expressed clearly and consistently throughout the working group process, and which are laid out in detail in the minority report, authored and signed by 10 of the 25 working group participants, including all the advocacy groups, most of the service providers, and the two unhoused members. There are many things listed there, but the primary thing that we asked consistently for was a designated safe space for people to camp before any new restrictions or enforcement. However, the only policy that this resolution tackles with any urgency is the imposition of new restrictions. It provides no timeline for the creation of a safe parking program or designated campsites or any assurances that those will actually materialize. All right, and so she spoke a lot more on this particular topic and discussed a lot of the issues. Um, simply put, the city of Missoula is way over in their head in providing services to the citizens without creating paths for individuals to pursue beyond the limited services. Thus far, citizens are more concerned about the overall lack of input that was given and disregarded in favor of buffer and restrictions. Gomez gave a very clear and concise comment, and I wanted to uh, transition to some of the homeless individuals who are part of the working group, and Catherine Hernandez, someone who has went from a fixed income to dealing with legal issues resulting in prison time and one thing led to another which is what resulted into her homeless and this is her story. We well, had the misconcept that once you come out of prison they set you up with a job no place to live and that's a myth. I have gone through the system. I have never been so shunned, um, embarrassed, uh, felt bad in my entire life. Um, I got kicked out of both the Johnson House and the Pavarello for having incontinence problems due to blood clots they found in my legs and the medication I was taking. Just a couple weeks ago, my local doctor uh, 
cleared me and said I no longer have this problem and that I should be able to reside back into one of these places. My um, good friend, Natty, right there at the end on the hot team, took that letter to the Pavarello. He took it to the Johnson Center. He took it to Salvation Army because I was denied being able to even take a shower because of that problem. And he said, look, she's over it. She doesn't have this problem. You need to readmit her, at least let her take a shower. They all denied it to this day. They denied it. All right. And uh, while during this particular meeting, I heard that uh, her story isn't anything new from uh, waiting from one service to the next and being told not to be in places. She, sur she had to survive uh, three of the past winters in Missoula in which she had to have someone give her CPR to res resuscitate her. Currently, she was put up by some people in the meeting to give her a place to stay. Overall, the resolution didn't ban camping, but it did put requirements into set up and tear down on a regular basis with no means of sustaining a stable location for individuals for services to reach them. And I'm going over a lot of this because the comments repeat a lot of this information going forward. Dean Johnson spoke on the resolution and to look further into preventing camping near rivers and drainage through the city of Missoula. And this is what he had to say. Present, my children do not feel safe playing on the beaches and brushy areas of the Clark Fork due to the nature of people camped in these areas, nor do I feel they are safe playing alone in these areas, which should not even be an issue here in Missoula, Montana. This same sentiment is felt by other adults and parents I have spoken with. 50 feet does not encompass all areas where people may want to recreate or seek solace along our waterways and not have to worry about their safety. Environmental and water quality. I don't think I have to explain or elaborate on the human waste, sharps hazards, garbage that accumulate in transient camps. Do we want this accumulation in our open spaces and waterways? Do we want to send these items downstream to our waterway neighbors? Then there is the cost and hazards associated with cleanup and removal. Not an easy task. Why repeat the process and costs that has been going on for years? We should learn from our history. And uh, city parks and recreation have spent tens of thousands of dollars cleaning up uh, these campsites after the fact. Uh, the resolution also includes a 60-foot buffer to rivers and streams within the city. The overall sentiment in the last comment is creating safety for residents who essentially uh, removing individuals people don't feel comfortable being around. Many misconceptions between residents and housing with housing versus individuals without are the overall lack of information about those living on the street, which in turn creates this projective approach in dealing with the idea of homeless people rather than the person who happens to be homeless. Uh, Alec Alexandria Schaefer, resident near the Palorello Center Homeless Center, speaks on this resolution from her experience. For the last year, I've experienced living in close proximity to folks experiencing houselessness. I've experienced sitting in my own apartment wondering if my neighbors have made it through the night when it's 20 below. I have, sorry, <clears throat> I have experienced walking my dog to the sounds of generators, the smells of cooking food, and the sights of my neighbors sweeping the sidewalk and picking up garbage and shaking out welcome mats to place them in front of their tents, cars, and campers. This policy measure, it, this policy isn't a measure towards a cohesive community, but rather is destabilizing and inhumane and attacks people who are already at their most vulnerable. I wish this conversation was happening when it was 20 below, and that would fully demonstrate the lack of empathy this policy has in its current form. And just to kind of give a retrospect on the concept of when we were talking about the winter warming shelter back in 2018, even, even before that, uh, there was a big push for providing housing during the winter months and we were definitely dealing with one of the colder winters of that particular time and some of the background of that one had to do with the fact that the Salvation Army stepped up during the winter warming shelter and provided shelter for people who were freezing and then it started extending over the transit center which is the bus stop area in the downtown area where they would provide indoor uh, places for people to stay when they wanted to stay warm and then that's when they started to roll out more and more places to be able to grow this Hence, the Johnson Street Shelter became a shelter for emergency winter only, and it would happen basically between a certain set amount of times. And then it grew a little bit more just because the pandemic caused a lot of uh, issues, especially when it comes to that. And I've mentioned this before, especially last week, is that the Johnson Street Shelter did give a presentation before this whole resolution was in place, and they were talking about how the Johnson Street Shelter has uh, helped over 900 unique individuals with 130 plus of them being veterans. And so that is something in a, which is a major uh, growth in increase in the last year compared to the year 
of last year, which they were saying that they would see uh, a, an average about a 639 unique individuals in that particular time. So there's definitely been a major increase of homeless individuals in the city of Missoula using these um, services. Kalia Ivey talks about uh, these trails and the interactions with the homeless as well, and this is what she had to say about, oh, this is what he had to say about that, so excuse me. I live in Riverfront neighborhood, and I use the Kim Williams every single day to commute to work on my bike, and I have never had an issue with any of my neighbors who live unhoused. They camp well past 8 a.m., <laughs> and they are definitely at odds if they have to pack up before then. I think this resolution is what makes this country a laughing stock to the rest of the world. In a world that is so inhumane, and when we have so many issues, why is it that we create more problems for individuals who are struggling the hardest in our communities? It makes me sick. I can't even look at some of you. I think to be in politics, you really have to have a strong stomach. Uh, so I commend you for that. I hope you don't get kidney stones. I, um, I'm ashamed. I love the city of Missoula, and I'm ashamed of the city of Missoula. All right. And yeah, I mean, then we get a little bit more of another perspective of it as we go further down into this, and this uh, are representatives of a lot of different community programs, Missoula Area Chamber of Commerce and more. Melanie Brooke spoke on this resolution in a joint statement with a bunch of uh, city leaders and business owners. We recognize the challenges faced by those experiencing houselessness, and we want to seek compassionate and effective solutions. At the same time, the impacts that urban camping are having on our community, including concerns related to the health, the safety, the accessibility for residents, property owners, employees, customers, visitors, and our children in Midtown Missoula and the rest of Missoula have become unbearable. We need swift action on buffer zones around our schools, our parks, our trails, and our shelters. This is an immediate first step to create a safer and more welcoming environment for the whole community. We are so grateful for your work on this. We are so excited about this resolution and this ordinance and the change it can give us moving forward, especially now that summer is here. Our kids want to return to these parks. Um, just speaking from the Midtown perspective, there was a shooting on a Sunday afternoon and a young family is told to shelter in place while um, a whole incident happened in MRL Park. The Urban camping effects spilling into our public spaces are having a ripple effect through the whole community, and we need immediate action. And the MRL Park is the, uh, the uh, Montana Railing Park that's located near the Johnson Street Shelter. Um, Stephanie Lang, uh, Land, uh, author and writer of the book called Made, which was adapted into a Netflix show, uh, spoke on this matter about her own struggles with dealing with homelessness and struggling to basically ma make ends meet for her and her children. Whenever people ask me what my big break was in becoming an author, I tell them about our 600 square foot apartment in the Missoula Housing Authority. The parameters were unique. After earning approval to move in, my rent was fixed and not variable depending on my income. I did not have to continue to reapply or prove that I still needed to be there. Not only that, there was no income limit, meaning that if I started to make more than their cap was to call, qualify, I wouldn't get kicked out. My rent payments were paid through a program that would help me build credit. We were invaded constantly to make sure that everything was clean. There was a handyman who fixed things promptly. We had two bedrooms, a smaller fridge and a freezer, a stacked washer and dryer combo and a bathtub. I had air conditioning in, for the first time in my whole life. Most of all, I felt respected as a renter. That small apartment gave me dignity as a human being. Without it, my oldest daughter, who was about to enter the first grade, would have been one of the estimated 28% of the children in Missoula's public school system who experience homelessness at some point in the school year. Housing security allowed me to write my way off of food stamps. I wrote my first memoir made at the kitchen table of that small apartment. I always wonder how many other people could use a lucky break like that. All right. And so that was Stephanie Land, author and writer. 
Um, I wanted to give you a scope of the comments as they went into the uh, late hours of uh, Tuesday morning. The city council members who spoke against this buffer zones included Dana Carlino and Christian Jordan, who previously stormed out of, oh, Christian Jordan's previously stormed out of the committee of the whole meeting last Wednesday, calling it effing BS, um, I paraphrased. Uh, Christian Jordan spoke on about removing buffer zones, and this is what she had to say. Committed to ensuring that individuals and communities that are historically and currently marginalized have a voice and are authentically included in planning and policy making. I value the times when that does occur on council and I'll continue to strive in creating increased space for this important consultation. I think it's exceptionally timely, timely that we are recognizing Juneteenth tonight as we continue the conversation about Missoula's unhoused population. I look forward to the creation of a proclamation for our unhoused neighbors that commemorates the emancipation of prejudices against the basic human right of housing, that celebrates a social safety net provided by a caring nation and that rededicates ourselves to the cause of humanity. I've been on council for two and a half years now. Since my start, I have been the object of direct bullying and harassment, multiple unreturned phone calls and deliberate sabotage by other councilors. I've been regularly and, dir and directly targeted by Martin Kidston of the Missoula Current who deliberately writes inaccurate stories about me and my work. As many city councilors, staff, as many city staff councillors and constituents have also noticed. I've had promises made to, be my, made to me by council members that have gone unfulfilled. I've had members of council text me across the horseshoe saying thank you for saying what you said, but not turning on their own mic and standing with me publicly. Okay. And then we have a quote from Daniel Colino who uh, talks a little bit more about this as well. Um, he also has some things to say about this. We all agreed that we weren't going to use fines for this ordinance. However, in the ordinance, there's written municipal infractions, which comes with a fine. I looked at every single member of the group, and I, as we presented our uh, subcommittee's uh, report, and I said, are you all okay with no fines and no jail time? Because that's what we worked on as an urban camping working group, and that's what we're presenting. I, do you all remember me saying that? And I asked the group and no objections. Everybody was okay with no fines and no jail time. So my question is, how did that end up in the ordinance? How, why is there fines in the ordinance? Because that did not come out of the working camping group. And actually we specifically said that we're not gonna put fines in the ordinance. So who came up with that? And are we willing to change that to actually follow what the working group came up with? Okay. And so if you actually paid attention to the beginning of the quote from Mayor Andrea Davis is that the working group gave recommendations for the city and then the city used the recommendations to draft this resolution, which where you can see a lot of this backlash. And now we have Stacey Anderson, who in many ways, I wanted to kind of throw this up here because this is kind of encompasses a lot of the city who are going to vote this resolution through um, and their sentiments in this particular matter, how it's pretty much kind of sums up how the city is has been and probably will be approaching this moving forward of the current service providers said that they would be willing to uh, to partner with the city to run an authorized campsite the city of Missoula is not in the position to run an authorized campsite there are no current partners who are willing to author to run an authorized campsite we do not have the land we do not have the, um, as the mayor had said, the you know necessary porta potties, all of the various things that have to be gone into to provide for an authorized campsite, um, and we don't have the money. We are limited in our resources, and so we have decided that the thing that provides the most benefit to the majority of people, not everybody, is funding the Johnson Street. Is it an ideal situation? Absolutely not. Would I love for everybody to have an opportunity to have a two bedroom apartment with a stacked washer and dryer? A hundred percent. But that is the federal government authorizing the housing authority with vouchers, not us here around this dais. Would I love for everybody who is suffering from mental health issues to have a caseworker? Absolutely. But that's the state government cutting case services. And so what we're doing here in Missoula is trying to answer those questions that we do not have the tools to deal with. And here is, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that was pretty much pretty common amongst the city council staff talking a little bit about this. And so far, the rest of the meeting, the city went back and forth, adding amendments to the resolution to give more leniency to those being evicted from sites by providing a window of time to remove personnel belongings before that deadline. But those amendments by Carlino never passed. 
the meeting kind of went back and forth for quite a bit some time towards the end but overall they're passed the resolution in whole um, but I want to end with uh, Zoe Zephyr who is a Montana House District 100 spoke about um, the attempts to amend and the overall circumstances of how uh, you know representing the state and how she feels about how Missoula is representing themselves in this particular matter. And I think particularly with Councilmember Carlino's first amendment here, when we talk about saying we're planning to or hoping that down the line we might someday, if the mayor, either this one or a future one, deems it appropriate, shows that we are not taking that mismatch seriously. It shows that we are saying we are allowing ourselves to say, well, a solution to help these people that can come later. We need to take care of the enforcement now. But the harm comes now. And it's important to say that. And likewise to Councilmember Anderson, who said that the city is not in a place to be a service provider. And the mayor who mentioned um, contractors who had backed out. <clears throat> it is important to note if the city is not in a place to be a service provider, if the city does not have resources to find a service provider, it should not be in the place to enforce these kinds of restrictions. All right, there we go. And um, that was the end of the, my city council, of the city council. Uh, the amendment to resolution came and went with the majority of council voting recommended uh, motions down with the resolution passing with no change. Carlino and Jordan have spoken against this and are unhappy with this inhumane situation and will keep moving people uh, away from place to place with the ordinance also looking to get moving forward and this would include fines and warnings and stuff like that for people who illegally camp pass those resolution uh, ideas and, and you know and recently uh, the city of Missoula uploaded a report from the city uh, as like a news flash and this is what it said the Missoula City Council approved a resolution Monday night setting a policy on where and when and how people can live in public places and tents in the city it also directs the mayor to investigate providing such services as lockers temporary bathrooms trash collection and sharps containers creating a program to regulate the use of city streets by people living in vehicles and designating safe parking slash or and or uh, and or safe temporary camping sites the draft resolution is available on the item 1.9 a final version of the amendment incorporated with the will be available in the next few days enforcement of the policies and responses to complaints will remain in remain the same but will take additional time if the volume of complaints increase if you feel in danger or a crime is being committed, call 911 to report an encampment that poses a health and safety concern that or appears to be out of compliance with the resolution with place, time, and manner of restrictions. Uh, visit the city's unsheltered living webpage and fill out the online form um, or by calling 552-6006. Again, that number is 552-6006. Um, I sprinted through a nearly 10 hour meeting and with a focus on this resolution that has filled the Missoula citizens concern over growing over homeless for which the city keeps kicking the can of affordability down the lane with no mention of curbing costs of living which in recent years the hikes to rent and more have resulted in the increase in homeless in and around the Missoula overall and I just got to say this for my own personal opinion not to be uh, biased or anything like that, but if you wanted to solve homelessness in the city of Missoula, reduce uh, rent by at least two to four hundred dollars, and the a good chunk of the people who are using these uh, services uh, can be more toward uh, be geared more towards the people who are chronically homeless compared to the newly homeless who are dealing with this very uh, high rent and high cost of living, which is an averaged about twelve hundred dollars a month for Missoulians to live in that of solo autonomous kind of sphere of basic studio personal liberties and individuality kind of stuff so uh, housing uh, so we're going to go into a little bit other community meetings as well oh dang I had a whole bunch of things going on but I still have plenty of time for my morning show I st I'm <laughs> It's kind of crazy. I had uh, there's definitely a lot of quotes going on here like this, but we're going to talk a little bit about budget and finance, which they're talking about public works and mobility for fiscal year 2025 budget. I, I usually don't do budget finance every year, but this year it seems like they're they're talking about quite a bit of bit of stuff. So here's Logan McInnes uh, talking about the uh, Missoula Water Company, which includes sewer water, wastewater, uh, storm water, uh, you know, all this stuff that basically. Uh, deals with water and wastewater. So this is what uh, Logan McGinnis had to say about their budget. And just kind of want to point out our revenues, budgeted revenues are about $2.8 million higher than our budgeted expenses. So one of our goals is to do some internally funded capital projects. 
because applying for loans is quite time consuming and some types of projects may not even be eligible for loans or are not well suited to the restrictions that come along with state revolving fund loans. So for FY25, we we're planning about $3 million in internally funded capital improvements. All right, so there's a lot of money going into place. Um, I mean, before the city owned their own water company, a lot of this money would just go to line the pockets of the shareholders. And essentially because we, because we were able to get this public utility and the money that, and revenue that was gained through this, we were able to improve our water infrastructure and improve it overall. And so overall, some of the funds looks to be uh, 150,000 more dollars in revenue versus the $120,000 less in funds, which you pay for. They want to add a maintenance monitor, which will branch from operations manager, which took the additional work in the past, but they wanted, but was too much compared to what the original job meant to cover admin versus basic hands-on maintenance. Water main replacement had a budget reaching over $2 million in projects, with stormwater being well over $1.5 million in projects. In your impact rates, uh, they were able to go to the Public Service Commission and get an uh, increase. So uh, essentially, you will get the your water, which includes the three utilities from waste, storm, and water, will increase by a combined total of roughly five dollars a year until the end of 2027. So every for the next three years, your in your, your water rates will increase by five dollars. Sorry, uh, just kind of a spoiler right there, and that's part of this meeting. So another item in is the mobility, which had a quite a lot to do with the Build Back Better. This had a lot to do with all these projects. And just so you know, this is a big impact. And I was talking a little bit about how like City of Missoula is getting like millions and millions of dollars. And this actually quantifies how much money the city is actually getting, which a fund of $70 million worth of grants $70 million worth of grants impacted Missoula's transportation infra infrastructure. This is more than double of last year. So Aaron Wilson, planning manager, talks about these funds. And if you take a look at this before I play the video, you can see that a lot of these uh, raised grants, federal funds, build, all these kind of roadway improvements, everything right here, get a lot of money in, re in regards to community investment programs. And here is Aaron Wilson. And we've talked about this a lot. We've been very successful with our, our federal grants. And so grants alone is, uh, represents a little over a third of that $70 million. Um, and those are projects that span over a number of years. Um, and, and so we'll see that kind of up and down over the next four or five years as we get those grant funds coming through. Um, in this current federal fiscal year, um, as we'll see, the, the bulk of that is the downtown SAM project. So we're finally getting that, that funding programmed, um, the federal funding portion of that project programmed. And then we'll be spending that on projects. So that project will extend for at least the next four or five years. All right, so there's definitely a lot going on in the city of Missoula. And I wanted to give you kind of an abridged version of those committee meetings as we move forward. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about public safety and health because this is something that's impacting the youth as a whole because um, over 50% of kids that are being rushed to the hospital are dealing with uh, uh, cannabis consumption, overconsumption products. Um, this is something that I've been worried about since many of the products that kids have been able to hide are those the ones that are not smokable. So, you know, there's, you know, vaping was such a huge uh, epidemic five years ago. A lot of those kids have grown up and are very dependent on a lot of those vape pens that I've seen now. Uh, but this is mostly anecdotal from what I've seen. So don't take it into, don't, don't take it so much at face value. But the one of the things is that because of the way that marijuana is being produced, the city of Missoula is trying to figure out a way to kind of curb youth usage. And so, you know, right nowadays with recreational marijuana, it's a lot easier to hide uh, the THC components that are in um, edibles, vape, which has a higher concentration compared to the state, which requires leaves to be at 35% THC, which is much higher than it would have been years and years ago. Um, but just because it's legal and you can do crossbreeding and all that kind of stuff, the state has a cap on the leaf. But when it comes to edibles and all that kind of stuff, you can go as high as 99% THC, which is ridiculous. And so Gwen Jones talks a little bit more about this item uh, as they launch this presentation. The THC potency is much stronger now in many of these products than um, in prior generations. So there's kind of a cultural mismatch happening in that 
kind of a different product that is actually um, being legally sold. But with our youth population and those developing brains, we are seeing some really, really big impacts in our community. So that is, that's kind of the, the issue that we're looking at today. I do want to clarify in the ordinance, um, there was a mistake. I needed to delete the word medical. This is only focused at recreational cannabis dispensaries, and I think I saw that in the ordinance title. So, it's All right, so that was Gwen Jones uh, talking more about that. And as they get further into the presentation, they have Dr. Melanie Cunningham, pediatrician, who speaks out about the dangers of some of these uh, high concentrated um, uh, THC uh, products. Much of this is, is in the ordinance, but I really wanted to highlight some points. In 2000, the average strength of THC, the active ingredient in cannabis, was 5%. Presently, it can be up to 35%, and for those edibles, it can go up to <clears throat> um, no, no limit. So yes, seven times the previous potency, so it's really significant. <clears throat> There are dev devastating and sometimes lifelong physical and mental impacts of cannabis use. I'm highlighting only a few. Worsened lung capacity for those who smoke marijuana. That again is logical. Increase the odds of motor vehicle crashes and the consequences of those terrible crashes. And this is not a small increase. It's 20 to 30% when cannabis is present in uh, someone who has been stopped for a DUI. These cannabis DUIs have, cannabis related DUIs have doubled in the last seven years. This cannabis use can lead to lower IQ. We know what that means, diminished memory. We know what that means, especially those of us who are getting older. Um, increased episodes of psychosis and psychosis is hallucinations and deta detachment from reality and we know that that can lead to some dangerous behaviors. All right and so that was Dr. Uh, Melody Cunningham talking a little bit more about that. Um, one of the things and one of the things that I've definitely been um, uh, the, the takeaway from this in particular is those studies, those kids uh, still have squishy brains and those projects don't help their brain development and could create a dependency related to addiction and abuse. This ordinance is uh, to weigh the risks when it comes to youth 12 to 17 who have uh, had gotten treatment for abuse to make up more than 50% of these treatments and hospital visits amongst the youth. Mike Collier, police, uh, police, police chief, talks about some of the uh, police officers inside the schools and some of their stories dealing with uh, cannabis use. Uh, one of the SROs said that in the past four years, he's had at least six students who were hospitalized from smoking high concentrations of THC and that his first and immediate recommendation would be to limit access to dispensaries. So that was his perspective. Another SRO told, <laughs> opened his comments to me that the, the numbers were, quote, staggering and embarrassing um, related to the number of kids in his school that routinely use, um, that use marijuana products. He said that it is not difficult to predict that when you legalize a drug for adults that it becomes more accessible to young people. Yep. And that's a good point I kind of want to leave on, too. Uh, it's always like a downstream thing. You know, you can have a dispensary. Anyone with half a brain who knows these kids always have an older connection that is able to provide these products for youth, whether it be friends, family, or it's outsiders looking to turn a profit by exploiting youth in recreational weed. Smoking is something that you cannot hide as much as those edibles and vapes that are easy to hide the skunk smell. Aaron Pian talks about the impacts of this ordinance. Three pieces of business before you today. The first is a resolution initiating a moratorium on accepting new business license applications for cannabis dispensary operations and calling for a review of public health concerns regarding the large number of cannabis dispensary operations within the city. And so this essentially um, directs staff to stop accepting and processing those applications as a of July 8th. Uh, the next business is in uh, ordinance amendment form. So in ordinance to amend Title V of the Missoula Municipal Code to add a section to an act of prohibition on new licenses for retail, adult use, or medical cannabis dispensaries pending review of the regulations applicable to such operations as part of the city's uniform development code. So essentially that places 
um, uh, a restriction on us issuing new business licenses while we look to other regulatory tools that we have, um, primarily through land use uh, code and the Unified Development Ordinance to take another look at our buffers and to think about that use and where that use belongs across the community to try to... All right, so that was Aaron Pien talking a little bit more about just restricting more of these businesses uh, being able to be more sporadically out there in the open for people to get to. But like I said before, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's just as bad as if you were to think about liquor stores or casinos or anything like that in the city of Missoula. People always say it's like, oh, there's so many dispensaries. Like, yeah, but there's also a lot of casinos, bars and liquor stores. You know, like, don't, don't just blame one thing just because of the other thing. I'm not defending, like, this kind of this kind of behavior but there's just been a lot of things in terms of just like the cultural response to this not to mention you know it's there was I mean Missoula is such a big weed friendly kind of town even before legalization so this kind of major impact with the youth it definitely is very hard to kind of like deal with in the future it, it, it's even hard to really kind of talk about exactly because I don't really understand the concepts of what's really going on with the youth because when it comes to youth and especially with this illegal use of marijuana, you know, if they're under the age of 18, they are not, they cannot be like published their name out there. So these kind of stories you don't really hear about. It's kind of like when you have children court, you know, those things aren't public knowledge. It's very much as like, it's very kind of like, it goes under the radar legally because those, those uh, things are sealed. And so we don't know a lot of these things. And so we only get a glimpse of this through public safety and health and uh, the police in which they're only able to come up with numbers and certain stories that will not shine a light on individuals who are considered minors. So it is interesting and there's a lot of things happening in the city of Missoula and I kind of want to end it there. I um, also wanted to mention that the uh, Committee of the Whole happened this week and they also talked about the follow-up and they talked about the resolution and the ordinance push to uh, put fines and things in issue warnings and fines with the city considers illegal, illegal camping. You can find those informations by going on to the city of Missoula's website, ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful resource for you to get involved with city politics, see what's going on there, talk about the budget season. They also, uh, like where, what I said, they have their news when they talked about the resolution of passing the uh, camping ordinance resolution kind of deal, urban camping, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to throw it on over to some of our promos and some of the things that are uh, airing on MCAT and some of the activities that MCAT's going to be uh, uh, recording throughout the summer and more. And so without further ado, here is some of the uh, things that MCAT makes. <laughs> you know, that thing of learning to rely on my imagination. And then when I was in college, I had some professors say that um, I, I was pretty good at writing. So then I decided that I was going to be a writer with a capital W and wear a black turtleneck and look important. <laughs> and, um, and that took up a good 10 years of my life, but I wasn't writing anything. And then when I was... Uh, 30 years old, I thought, I'm going to start doing this. I'm just going to start writing and see what happens. Thanks so much for being here. Um, yeah, my name it's is nice Elizabeth. to talk with y'all. Yeah, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm a reader. Um, oh, I have... I'm a reader too, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions. Um, the first is, have you ever changed the name of a character halfway through writing a book? And my second question is, what are you reading right now? Uh, I love both of those questions. Um, and the the first question, um, I haven't changed the name, but when uh, I did a rewrite of uh, The Magician's Elephant, um, uh, 
my editor said the main character's name in there when I turned in the draft was, I, I had him as Tito, T-I-T-O. And she said, uh, it, I don't, she didn't like it. Um, she thought um, it was kind of a misleading kind of name because of politics and stuff. And so she wanted his name to be changed. And it was surprising to me how incredibly difficult it was for me to do that. It was, uh, you know, and everything that I had to do of rewriting that novel, changing his name and, and finding the right name, which became Peter Augustus Duchin, um, was really, really difficult. And so it, it showed me how much the names matter to me and how much of the story is embedded in, in the name. Welcome back. Let's talk about some uh, new movies that are coming out this week. And it's time for Pre-Critic, where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing but my pre-biases towards movies in general. Kicking things off is Inside Out 2. I didn't even know this was coming out until it just came out. Well, you heard the complaints on multiple emotions being left out of the original, and you're going to get a full spectrum of emotions with five more emotions taking over the body of a girl who frankly seems to have emotional breakdowns on the regular for our entertainment. Uh, so... The first one has sadness and joy on the uh, fragile psyche of a little preteen uh, coming to terms with their feelings. And this one is a little bit more related to girls who abandon their old friends with the cool new friends who frankly have their own problems that comes to head, comes to a head in the, uh, f uh, in the finale, which might have the Riley, the main body character, and the emotions avatar learn to work together because it's always about working together and everything like that. That's basically how it always is. Okay, this next one is called Treasure. So, uh, nothing says funny like a road trip to the Holocaust Museum, and Lena Dunham from Girls is looking to capitalize on this weary comedy about a man who will relive his trauma from surviving the Holocaust by sabotaging their trip at every corner before having a cathartic moment with his daughter wants to use for her big-time New York journalism job. I'm assuming this will be a fun father-daughter movie, uh, but this is based in 1991 because the actors would be too old and they would need to convince people otherwise. Uh, then we have Ghost Light. This one is one of those movies that kind of went on the circuits and making some waves here and around there. And I'll, I'll tell you that when I watched the trailer, I kind of teared up a little bit, but it's basically imagined like a kind of like a, a New Jersey kind of construction tough guy, you know, um, and he basically gets into theater and he's ashamed of it because he's like the tough guy. But anyways, this seems like one of those dramas that'll go straight to video on demand. But hey, we're here to talk about Romeo and Juliet theater play performed by a construction working looking to spice up his life with a little bit of community theater. If that isn't enough, enjoy a teenager who is dealing with emotional problems trying to reach her dad who is keeping this secret close to the chest as he uses this outlet to become in tune with his feelings while also avoiding family therapy. So, you know... Why, you know, why go to therapy when you can go above and beyond anything else? When in doubt, don't go to therapy. Join a theater troupe. Uh, following with latency. So you like gaming, right? Well, we have the chips to let you game without using your hands. Now, this movie follows an online gamer as she gets popular enough to test run a new technology in a be careful what you wish for kind of scenario thriller, which starts as intuition in the gaming world soon to become obsession with long form gaming and losing it in touch with reality. In the end, the magic device might have some sinister motives as the game gets too real. I want to say Escape Room X uh, Matrix style, get out of passing level because you lose the game, you die in real life kind of thing. So yeah, it's it's not original, but it is it is what it is. It's very much like, let's just do a Black Mirror, but make it into a movie. So uh, speaking of movies, I uh, was able to do uh, dubbing stuff for you guys this morning, as I'm really just kind of running so late on time, just because that city council meeting, city council and community meetings were in so long. A new dubbing stuff uh, featuring the Duke himself in Stagecoach 1939. Oh, yeah, you're going outside? I just need some time to think, okay? Well, that's not what I like to do. Thinking ain't no good. Don't worry, I'll straighten you out. Get over here for a second. Uh, please, uh, please, sir, listen to me, listen. Uh, you must give the lady some space before you confront her. Oh. You can trust me. I know her intimately, very intimately uh. indeed. 
Just give her some time. She needs it. She needs all the time. You know where you can take the Gregorian calendar? I know you like lighting your cigarettes here, but it won't work. It's mostly glass. Oh. Huh. You're saying? Well, okay. I guess the rules of space and time don't apply to you. The only law I listen to is Godwin's law. Oh, but nobody referenced them. Nobody's referenced those people. And no one will. All right, now where'd she go? Oh, she didn't get too far. Let me go talk to her for a second. Hey, uh, Brenda, I've noticed that you've been kind of, uh, perturbed by me lately. Is there anything I can do to... <laughs> I don't, I don't really know. I'm just a, uh, a simple, small-town girl out here on the ranch. Uh, what kind of small town do you come from anyways? Well, I come from a place called Three Beaver. Uh, is it some kind of, a uh, a dam building logging town? Perhaps maybe there's like a, uh, a fork in the road and three roads lead to this town and whatever? That would make sense on the geography of it all, but naming it Three Beaver seems kind of, uh, kind of, uh, kind of strange. Oh, I, I, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's different. Yeah, you understand me? I don't like the way you're looking at me. It's uh, making me uncomfortable, giving me a thing called uh, anxiety. You know what that is? Well, what's anxiety? Well, it's when you... Uh, Put yourself in a situation that you just seem to can't get out of. So you consider this conversation a situation? Uh, isn't everything a situation? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, mm, mm, I don't like this. I'm just trying to be honest. Keep your anxiety to yourself. Uh, what do you hey, mean? Hey, guys. What's going on over here? I was pointing out that our conversation gave me anxiety. Do you honestly think that was a good idea? Because anxiety begots anxiety. Hey guys, we're back. We're here talking about some of the events that are happening this weekend. It is Pride Weekend, kicking things off uh, tonight with the uh, uh, so many different things happening with the block party that extends from the 14th to the 16th with the wrap up. Uh, they're going to be doing off of Main Street. You can't miss it. It's going to be all over downtown. Um, it's yeah. You know, I'll, I'll go to their website right now. Probably should have went to it a little bit sooner, but yeah, it's a whole deal. All sorts of festival, music, fun. Fun times for everyone just to enjoy and go outdoors and see a bunch of people and meet and greet. Yep, all the events that are happening, you click on the events on the uh, Missoula-Pride.com. And here are some of the things that are happening right here. You can see some of the stuff that's happening from Thursday, Revival Comedy, 18 Plus Performance, and also Run Wild Missoula is doing a, a, a run and everything like that. Trans Youth Space with Trans Visible, uh, Seven Generations Four, Two Spirits, uh, three, third annual Missoula, uh, Missoula Block Party Night One, and then they'll have it tomorrow when they have the parade and everything and more. Um, I'm going to jump right into uh, the events as a whole. Uh, Stroller Strides, Mommy Me, that's a workout class that happen at Bonner Park every weekday starting at 9.30 a.m. Missoula Butterfly House is open at 10 a.m., a great way to uh, uh, support the insectarium here in Missoula. Family Fun Time, Missoula Gymnastics, they have a lot of indoor fun there with the YMCA. It's going to be a cold week, and this weekend today is the last hot day before we have a little bit of a cool down for a little while. It rained last year during the Pride Parade, but that's just that. Um, Empower Place uh, is at the Missoula Food Bank. This is a great way for kids to experience the same level as the library with learning, books, but also have the ability to uh, utilize the food bank to get some food, cheap food for anybody who wants to get uh, access to that, and that goes until about 1 p.m. every Friday. But it's most, mostly open weekdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays for the long day, and then they have like a 10 to 1 p.m. most days, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, financial Literacy Class, Missoula Public Library. Want to control your finances, Missoula Public Library has a partnered with the International, uh, International Rescue Committee who has collaborated with Clearwater Credit Union to offer an ongoing financial education course. Each week will feature a new topic. If you miss a week, don't worry, the topic will be rotate continuously with the courses being held in English with the following interpretation schedule. Uh, yep, it's good. on June 14th, they're featuring uh, financial fitness cl classes for people who speak Swahili. 
Um, run Wild Pride Fun Run is happening at 10 a.m. at the Pride Crosswalk, which is next to the Missoula Art Museum. It's the, it's the only crosswalk that's not white. Uh, Tiny Tales in the Park. Missoula Public Library is excited to work with the Parks and Recreation to bring Tiny Tales to the park. Every Friday at 10.30 a.m., meet under the tree on the Sherwood sign of the park for songs, rhymes, and movements for kids aged 0 to 3 during inclement weather. Tiny Tales is held at the Lowell School Gym or Cafeteria, so this is going to be at Lowell School. Um, in their park, and you can't miss it. Uh, Trans Visible Empty Youth Space, Missoula Public Library is hosting from 10.30 to 12.30 uh, p.m. Uh, youth Services is hosting a Trans Visible for trans individuals who want a place to go and meet, meet and greet. Health Corners and immu 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 Immunization, I gotta slow down, Clinic Class 2, Wester, West Main Street downtown, and they're going to start that at 11 a.m. There's also a garage, sta garage, garage sale at the Valentine Community Center. This is across from Pacific Steel. It is a great, it's their indoor soccer park. They're doing a fundraiser for the youth camps. Uh, lunch at the Missoula Senior Center starting at 12, 1130. This is daily every Monday through Friday. Pavarella Center has breakfast, lunch, and dinners uh, all every single day. You can check those out as well. Yarns at Missoula Public Library. They don't have watercolor during the summer, but yarns is a great way for people to stitch and crochet up on the fourth floor in the Blackfoot boardroom. Seven Generations Forward, Missoula Public Library is hosting all sorts of kinds of things happening in the Missoula Public Library. You can check that out. Uh, Youth Adults Writers Group, as always, uh, every, every Friday at 3.30 p.m. They're going to have a two-spirit people, uh, their story of past and present, um, and I believe this is going to be at... Um, a lot of this is going to be at the Zach. I got to make sure. Yeah. Um, yep, it's going to be in Cooper Room B, the uh, Two Spirit, Our Story, Our People, just a little bit of history of Native American uh, queerness. Um, let's see, what else is that? Queer Under the Big Sky, a uh, Missoula Pride event at the Frame of Mind starting at 4 p.m. Uh, Aladdin at MCT. Um, MCT is the Missoula Children's Theater, is doing camps every single week with performances happening at the Missoula Children's Theater for 4 p.m. performance and 6 p.m. performances. And they usually uh, uh, rotate the cast depending upon who's going to play who. And so you want to make sure that the parents know which time the kids are going to be forming for their respective Aladdin version. So it's an abridged version of Aladdin, originally written by Missoula Children's Theater for their own use. Uh, summertime Lego Club, Missoula Public Library during the summer. Lego Club is moving to Fridays only from 4 to 5 p.m. Drop by the Imaginarium anytime to create fantastic Lego structures. Open Air presents the Genevieve Waller, uh, the Open Air Artist presentation at the Missoula Public Library for, at 4 p.m. Uh, snacks will be provided and there will be a chance to meet and mingle with artists. Uh, she's an artist curator and writer born in the heyday of disco and grew up in Wichita, Kansas. Her education includes as a bachelor in art history, master's in photography and art history, and a master's in visual and cultural studies. Uh, block Party Day 1, Western uh, Street uh, Pride Weekend, all sorts of events happening on Main Street, 4 p.m. Block Party starts. Uh, CFAC and Rainbow Beer release at Imagination Brewing Company. Um, Lolo Peak local vendors pop-up show, Lolo Peak Brewing and Grill. They're doing a vendor pop-up shop, so starting at 5 p.m. If you want to learn how to be a vendor and all that kind of stuff, it's a great opportunity to do that. Starting at 5 p.m., Lolo Peak Brewing Company and Grill. Uh, summer Stargazing in Montana. Universe Montana is doing uh, many things happening um, throughout the weekends. At the Planetarium, Dr. Mark Reiser will teach you all the night sky and give you tips on it from for a 5.30 session and a 6.30 session. Uh, Montana Family Center Allyship Ed Session at the Zootown Arts Community Center. They're doing a lot of things for people, family, allyship. The whole idea is education for families who have a queer family member. They're just like, I just don't know what to do. And you know, it's the, the Zach is gonna be doing that. I don't know why I said it like that, but. And then they also have another program uh, going adjacently at the Zach. It's called Kink 101 for 18 plus for people who have certain preferences and yeah, it's going to be interesting, especially when you're talking about kinks, because it's very sexual. Uh, Edwin, Eddie, so that's why it's 18 plus. Moving on, Edwin, Eddie, Jay Johnson is going to be playing some folk music at Imagination Brewing Company starting at 6 p.m. Sam Spoon is going to be hosting Charlie Hopkins uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, Kettle's Amphitheater is featuring Charlie Crockett at the Kettle House, Country Blues Music at 6.30 p.m. Karaoke at the Jackson Loon started at 7 p.m. Broad Comedy at 7.30 p.m. This is going to be this weekend long. Broad comedy, female-led comedy at the West Side Theater starting at 7.30 p.m. We got dueling pianos at Stave and Hoop at 8 p.m. Russ Nassif and the Revelators at 9 p.m. Playing Union Club music, Northern Lights, Sunrise Saloon, 
making some country music, Pansy Craze, the burlesque, and more review at the Zach. Uh, Daisy Chain presents Pride After Party Night 1. VFW is going to be hosting after night parties for the block party after they end at around 10 p.m. because there is a noise ordinance in the downtown Missoula area, so they want to make sure that people are fairly quiet in the downtown area, even though it, there's a lot of bars. Uh, Queer Mama Showcase at Monks, an evening uh, with the Fox Den at Conflux at 9.30 p.m. And then also, I want to mention this as well. This is uh, like an ongoing event. This isn't just happening tonight, but this is something that's happening in the city of Missoula. They're doing an artist call for traffic signal box projects. So if you want to make, if you want to uh, add some art to the 3D box and basically make a landmark through the city of Missoula that'll last for a long time, there's some that's been there for over 10 years. So it's definitely to put your mark and legacy in the city of Missoula. So it's a call to artists, traffic signal box projects, and they're going to open this open art call starting tonight. And then we're going to start doing our Saturday markets and such. If you're interested in going out to the farmer's markets every single Saturday from 8 a.m. to about 1 p.m., People's Market, Farmer's Market, uh, the River Street Market, a lot of vendors, food, and more. You get some waffles and all sorts of fun stuff there happening at the farmer's market. Special story time, plant a pollinator garden. Uh, and this is going to uh, happen for the special story time starting at 10 a.m. as opposed to 10.30 a.m. Uh, English as a second language class is at 9.30 a.m. in the Muzo Public Library. I'm kind of going out of order. Uh, and we're going to jump right ahead and we're going to go over to Deer Creek Shooting Center is hosting a Missoula Speed Steel Workshop. And this is a no cost welcome to Speed Steel Workshop at the Deer Creek Shooting Center. Uh, this is at 1142 Deer Creek Road. This is quite a distance past up uh, the highway. All skill lovers are welcome as, as kids and families join us whether you never fired a gun before or you're experienced shooting or just want to get ready for a match or anywhere in between. The purpose of this workshop is to show you how to learn all the organized shooting competitions like Missoula Speed, Steel Work, Practice Shooting, Match Safety Rules, and Have Fun Shooting a few courses of fire from Speed Steel Matches. So that's what's happening on Saturday. New Zealand Day, Fort Missoula Regional Park is going to celebrate the sister city in Palmerston North, New Zealand. Art Missoula and the Missoula All Maggots are hosting a tough rugby clinic and tourney at the Fort Missoula Regional Park, 10 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, Moon Randolph Homestead is doing their open hours at 11 a.m. This is an ongoing thing. You can check out the Missoula's own Homestead Missoula tour. But I also wanted to mention that just before I wrap up the show, and I think I'm going to throw every other events that are happening on Saturday kind of out the window as we are running out of time. I wanted to mention the Missoula Pride Parade is going to be featuring the Missoula Public Library. Also, MCAT and many of the partners of Under One Roof will be available for this particular parade just to walk around and show support for the Missoula Pride. And the whole idea behind this is to kind of support all the efforts that were made over the last many years to bring equality for those who are same-sex marriages, and give them the equal rights that, are, uh, cov that were coveted by straight relationships and more. And so I wanted to also mention that this is a celebration of those efforts and the continued efforts to make sure that everyone is treated equally and also to remember the, the, the struggles in the past to make sure that these kind of kind of things can continue to move forward to give peace people of not only Montana but the United States the uh, right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All right, so without further ado, I want to thank you guys for joining me. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. Take care, you guys, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend.